Well, hello everybody and a very warm welcome to this webinar, which is the first webinar in the, for the Centre of Academic Primary Care to run in this series. My name is Katrina Turner, I'm Professor of Primary Care Research at the University of Bristol and I'm co-head of the Centre for Academic Primary Care. And it gives me great pleasure to chair this webinar in which Dr Lucy Selman and Dr Liesl Dawson will share their experiences of co-creating a public engagement festival. In this case, the Good Grief Festival that was first launched in October 2020. Lucy is Associate Professor in Palliative and End of Life Care in the Bristol Medical School and the founding director of the Good Grief Festival. Lysol is Associate Professor in Literature and Culture at the University of Bristol with an interest in the, in the history of emotions. She's also the arts and culture lead of the Good Grief Festival. During this webinar, both Lucy and Liza will be sharing their experiences, and at the end, there will be time for questions and answers. If you have any questions while listening to the presentations, please put them in the chat function, and we'll read these out at the end. At the moment, your cameras and microphones have been turned off, but during the question and answer session, they'll be unlocked, so you will have the option of unmuting and putting on your cameras if you wish. Please note this webinar is being recorded, and will be posted on the Centre's website later. Please also note that a PDF of the slides will be made available to you after this event. Um, I'll now hand over to you, Lucy. Thank you so much for the introduction, Katrina. It's lovely to be with you all. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, so just give me a second. So um, thank you for joining us. I'm really delighted to be here today to talk about um, Good Grief Festival. And I'm really delighted to also be joined by Liesl Dawson. And we're gonna be doing a bit of a double act. So I'll be handing over to Liesl for the middle section of today's presentation. So I thought I would start with some background to the festival, why we created it. And that really starts with an awareness from my research and through my own personal experience. that although grief is universal, we struggle as a society to handle it. And this is evidence from a new YouGov survey, which came out just last week, that found that 43% of UK adults are worried about saying the wrong thing to someone who's been bereaved. 32% say they don't know how to start the conversation after a bereavement. And just over one in 10 have actively gone out of their way to avoid somebody who's grieving because they don't know what to say to them. And 49% of people who've not experienced a bereavement say that they are unprepared in knowing how to help a bereaved friend or relative. On a more positive note, 29% of UK adults are interested in learning how to better support the bereaved. For the bereaved, these social attitudes and lack of confidence can make bereavement lonely and difficult. So the same survey found that if people bereaved in the last five years, 29% said they didn't have access to the right bereavement support, 60% that their community had not helped them deal with their grief, and 30% had experienced people not referencing their loss at all. And we know from previous studies that younger people and people from black and minoritized ethnic communities are less likely to access professional bereavement support, even when they feel unsupported in their grief. And a key barrier here is feeling uncomfortable asking for help. So we conceived of Good Grief Festival as an antidote to some of these issues, um, as well as a way of engaging the public in grief research. So it was funded by the Wellcome Trust Public Engagement Funding Stream. And the aims of the festival were to provide ways to talk, think, learn about and share experiences of grief and widen access to uh, research from across different disciplines, as well as to bereavement services. And a specific focus was on disadvantaged young people and people from black and minoritized ethnic communities who experienced barriers to accessing bereavement services. And our overall vision was to support a shift in social attitudes and the development of more compassionate communities. So our co-applicants at the university included colleagues across Bristol Medical School, the School of Arts and the School of Humanities. And we drew together a really fantastic group of collaborating organizations working regionally and nationally who were all involved at the funding application stage. Um, so these organizations such as Arnest Vale Cemetery, the Watershed Cinema, um, Bristol Museum, Winston's Wish and The Harbour represent bereavement and end of life care charities young people's organizations and major local cultural ins, um, institutions and organizations in Bristol. 
So in particular, Arnos Vale Cemetery already ran an annual festival called Life, Death and the Rest uh, about death and dying, and they brought that expertise to the collaboration. We were also really fortunate to connect with Ashling Mustan, who is an events manager and producer with previous experience of putting on a citywide festival in Bristol. So we had plenty of diverse expertise and skills to help shape and deliver the festival. So in discussing this presentation with colleagues, the question of how you attract collaborators came up. So I just wanted to reflect a little bit on this. I think it's key to identify shared values and aims and try to understand what their goals are and how they might intersect with your own goals. You need to think about how you can help them achieve the goals they already have and how you can link with their existing work and priorities and timelines. And then there are also these relational aspects to consider. So you do need to think about earning people's trust and um, being authentic. And I think showing humility really helps in this. You need to show that you're there to listen and learn and that you don't see yourself as an expert. Actually, they are the experts in, in the work that they do. Um, and finally, in getting people on board and helping to create that sense of shared ownership, I think an inspiring vision is key. And reflecting on good grief, I think from the start, um, when I first came up with the idea for good grief and discussed it with colleagues, I tried to create a really clear and simple vision that was motivating and uniting. Um, grief does affect everyone uh, and everyone I spoke to about collaborating actually could see the value in what we were trying to achieve. And I did my best to be clear about my motivations and what we as a group of academics could bring to the collaboration. But I also tried to be clear about what I was not interested in doing and anticipate any concerns about this. So for example, stepping on people's toes, reinventing the wheel or stealing anyone's thunder. And I think that's really important as well. At the time I was trying something I'd never done before by reaching out to lots of different potential collaborators. And we were really delighted with the response um, to the funding call. Sorry, that was, a, that was a mistake I just made. So I just wanted to say, we really, um, you know, I, I reached out to lots of different types of collaborators and it was really about seeing who was interested and who was on board. So back to the festival itself. So we initially planned a citywide festival about grief and bereavement to take place in Bristol during Dying Matters Week in May, 2020. And working with our partners and in consultation with members of the public, which I'll talk more about later, we designed the festival to have three main strands. So core events at the university and at the Bristol Beacon, which were um, things like panel discussions, interviews, um, workshops and activities, and a, a conference with academics and members of the public at the university. And then a series of partner events, which were put on by local partners and collaborators. Um, this included things like a planned film series at the Watershed and events at Bristol Museum. And then finally, community events. And these were really about trying to ensure that the festival included people living across the city, not just in the city centre, and especially included people living in more disadvantaged areas. Um, and we ran this community events um, funding scheme so that um, small local organisations um, and charities could apply for small grants to run their own events. And we were really delighted with the response to that funding call. So as part of Good Grief, we also collaborated with a charity called the Creative Youth Network, which works with disadvantaged young people in the Bristol area. And over their spring term in 2020, they had grief as a theme for their nine creative courses, which they run for young people. And across these courses, 76 young people created artwork and performance pieces about grief, and they are available on their website in their showcase, you can see here. And I'd really recommend um, taking a look at those if you're interested. And then in the February half term, we also ran a filmmaking workshop, which involved um, youth workers, university, film students, and a bereavement counsellor. And five young women created a film called The Five Stages of Whatever, which is also available on their website. So by March 2020, of course, it became clear that um, due to the pandemic, the festival wasn't going to be able to go ahead um, as planned. And at the same time, the mass bereavement caused by COVID-19 was becoming a growing reality. We realised that there was more need than ever for a festival about grief, and particularly in the context of lockdowns and for many people increased social isolation. So after we had sort of scraped ourselves up off the floor and had time to reflect and regroup, we went ahead and redesigned the festival as an online event. 
And we weren't starting from scratch. So in that regard, we were really lucky, even though it was a really difficult time, I think, for the team. Um, we had a brilliant team of collaborators. We had a network of supporters and public contributors, and we already had a strong social media presence. Um, we knew that there was great interest in the festival um, because uh, of the response to the ticket sales prior to lockdown. So, you know, our events were ticketed. Some of them, uh, most of them were free, but some of them um, we did charge for the ones at Bristol Beacon to kind of cover the running costs. We also had the website and our links to speakers and facilitators and the original program to sort of adapt and, and grow. So what did we change in order to move it online? Um, first of all, we decided to make it completely free of charge um, to attend. Um, you know, as I said, some of our events previously have been um, charged. Oh, I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, I think somebody might be accidentally drawing on the screen. Um, the in-person festival um, was going to be seven days, so it was a much longer and sort of more ambitious um, affair. Um, and we decided to condense this down partly because of budget and partly because of what's appropriate in terms of online events into three days. We conducted some market research um, via social media and our email distribution list and designed a program of shorter sessions, um, which were interactive where possible. And some of the events we pre-recorded um, just for ease really, so that not the entire three days would, wouldn't be um, live online. We chose to run the festival with a pop-up studio in Bristol with like live facilitators who would link in to remote presenters, um, mainly via Zoom. Um, we did have to do constant contingency planning, which I think was one of the main kind of struggles, really, because we didn't know what the current kind of lockdown guidelines would be at the time of the festival. And in the end, we were lucky and work events were permitted at the time. Um, but there was another lockdown when I actually started um, just the following week. However, we did need to be ready to kind of shift onto a 100% online event um, at any time and, of course, follow government guidelines around um, social distancing. So we had two stages, a main stage plus workshops for the main stage, which, which was for sort of panel discussions, interviews and that kind of thing, and then a second stage for workshops and webinars. Um, because the festival now had a much wider reach than um, Bristol and the Bristol area, we were also able to bring in and collaborate with new partners. So Cruise Bereavement Support, Marie Curie and the Good Grief Trust. So here you can see the structure of the online festival and we included four main components here. So talks and interviews, workshops and webinars, the grief school, which was in collaboration with Cruise Bereavement Support, and this included discussions between academics, counsellors and people with lived experience on specific types of bereavement and loss. And then finally, grief chats, which were one on one discussions between members of the public who'd experienced the same type of bereavement or loss. Here you can see some of the speakers at the first festival, which included people like um, Professor Alice Roberts, um, comedians Carrie Ad Lloyd and Robert Webb, Stuart Lawrence and poet Vanessa Kisule. And throughout our festivals, we really try to be as inclusive and diverse as possible and pay attention to that right from the start. Um, we also aim to integrate different perspectives on grief and bereavement, so from clinicians and academics and therapists to members of the public and authors and poets. And these will talk a little bit more about how and why we did that um, later. So what happened? Um, over um, 8,500 people attended that first festival in October um, 2020, and we set up the Grief Channel as an on-demand portal for people to access all the recorded festival events. Um, and to access the Grief Channel is £20 for a year subscription, with any money generated then um, ploughed back into Good Grief. In January 2021, we were then approached by Marie Curie to deliver the online events for their National Day of Reflection, which they spearheaded on the 23rd of March. And Marie Curie and the University of Bristol also provided funding for two additional festivals last year, which were held in March and, and October. And we also put on a series of standalone events last year and a course with psychotherapist and author Julia Samuel over the summer. So it was a very busy um, year for all of us. So we wanted to reflect now and consider a couple of the key ingredients which we think have contributed towards the success of the festival. 
first of all, consultation and collaboration have been part and parcel of the work since the, the very beginning and as the festival has evolved as well. So as mentioned, we brought in partners um, right from the start and we conducted market research mainly through social media and later um, via email. First of all, to ascertain the interest in the festival and choose a name. And this information fed into the grant application to the Wellcome Trust. And then later to help redesign the online festival. So for example, to determine the optimal length and format um, of sessions for the online festival. I then also conducted eight listening meetings where I met with different groups of stakeholders over eight months. And this included three public involvement um, meetings which fed into the design and the content of the festival. In addition to this, we held collaborative meetings around every three months. So there was a lot of investment in listening and collaborating. And I actually think the work we did um, in person at the very beginning, so we started the planning process in sort of November 2019, was really critical to being able to then continue and move those um, consultation meetings online. So we were quite um, lucky in that regard. So I'm going to um, hand over to Liesl now, who'll talk more about another key ingredient, which was integrating the arts in the festival. Hello, nice to see everybody. Um, so I'm Liesl, and in this segment, I'm gonna talk about integrating the arts. And I'm gonna focus on three areas. How does integrating the arts benefit public engagement? How do they open up new perspectives? And I'm gonna finish with some brief examples of collaborative projects that either sprang from or fed into good grief. Next slide. Yeah, good. Okay, so firstly, how does integrating the arts benefit public engagement and open up new perspectives? Well, the arts can provide audiences with a way into emotionally charged subjects. Audience who might, audiences who might walk away from a festival about death and grief might nonetheless attend an interview with a well-known writer or celebrity or watch a segment that focuses on grief as it relates to music, Shakespeare, art, film, mountain climbing, mushroom picking, superheroes, Harry Potter, or the therapeutic impact of nature all of which have featured at the Good Grief Festival. And I have to say the, the list is endless. So if I gave you the full list, we would just have a, a, a sort of program on that. Ashleen, our event director, is brilliant at putting together a wide ranging program, giving audiences different ways into discussions about grief and death. Next slide. So whereas psychotherapists and grief counselors give us insight into the broader cognitive and bodily aspects of loss, novels, films, paintings, memoirs will often zoom into one person's unique experience. Artistic expressions thus highlight the individual and variable nature of grief, helping us to think about loss in particular and culturally specific ways. To give a few examples, author and songwriter Robert, Robert McFarlane explored the role that music plays in grief and how songs connect us to our memories and those who have died. Illustrator Gary Andrews, who I'll come back to, whose wife Joy died of sepsis, shared how his daily drawings helped him to express his emotions and adjust to his new life as a single father. The festival also featured a number of writers who have written powerful memoirs, including people like Siddharth Shongvi, Kathy Rensenbrink, Juliette Rosenfeld, Nikish Shukla, and Clover Stroud. Through these conversations, we can see how creative expression helps us to maintain our connection to the person who has died, renegotiate our relationship with them, and make their absent presence visible in our lives. Next slide, please. 
So integrating the arts also allows us to explore grief across a broad historical framework. And in this way, it helps us to understand our own cultural moment and how it relates to older paradigms of grief and mourning. We're currently living in an age where there are fewer ways to come together to express loss and where people often feel they need to hide their grief and keep their emotions in check. Such behavior follows in some ways a Freudian model whereby successful mourning involves getting over grief and moving on from the person who has died. However, psychotherapists now stress that healthy adaptive grieving does not involve getting over loss, but finding ways to accommodate it and find ways to express our continued bond to those who have died. But what, what might seem to be a new way of approaching grief actually harkens back to much earlier models where people wore their grief more visibly and found ways to carry the people who had died with them. So you can see on this slide the kind of Victorian dress, the mourning dress. You can also see um, the locket with the hair. And of course, there were hair bra bracelets. And people would have portraits done of children who had died, um, of loved ones who had died. So I think there used to be a sense that these were really kind of odd or macabre um, artifacts. But I think looking now through the eyes of grief and the ideas of continuing bonds, we can see them as really beautiful and tender expressions of love. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm now gonna turn to some examples of collaborative projects that either sprang from or fed into good grief. Um, I can say that the festival has actually changed my research focus. Um, I had planned to write a book about uh, grief in the 16th and 17th century. And after my work with the festival, I'm now writing a book about contemporary ideas about creativity and grief, which uses the examples, um, you know, the conversations, the people I've met through the festival. This work has been supported by a Brigstow funded project that explores the therapeutic potential of creativity and the way art can help us express and process loss. So it looks at the dual role that the imagination plays and it asks what happens to emotions and memories when we engage with them creatively. And why is it that some activities console whereas others intensify the pain of loss. Um, next slide. So Brigstow has also supported a related practices research component. Jimmy Hay, Natasha Rosling and I worked together on Lost Property, a collaborative short fiction film, which drew on our own experiences of grief and those of others. And um, we were interested to know really whether our emotions and memories changed when they were reconfigured into art and how the creative reshaping of experiences impacted our own grieving processes. Next slide. Um, Brigstow also supported two short films on YouTube. Children, Grief and Creativity is a short animation created through collaboration with psychotherapist Julia Samuel, MBE, and the animator and widower I mentioned before, um, Gary Andrews. And it aimed to convey some of the key messages about how to support children when they are grieving, and also how creativity can play a role in helping children to express emotion. And the second film, Children, Grief and Art Therapy, which was made with Victoria Tolchard and Gary Andrews again, explored examples of how art works in children's therapy for grief. Next slide. So as well as evaluating and discussing the festival, we also asked Jane, Jade Perkins to reflect on it creatively. And she made this beautiful booklet, Gathering, which offers an imaginative snapshot of one woman's experience of the Good Grief Festival. Robert McFarlane talked in his interview about music being both shattering 
and gathering. And I think this is also a really beautiful description for how the Good Grief Festival works. It's shattering in the sense it can connect you to the memories and emotions of loss, but it's also gathering in that it can help you gather yourself together in a compassionate community that comes together to share stories. Next slide. This is my final slide um, and the final collaborative project. Um, having worked with Jade, with the booklet that you've just seen, um, this also then had an impact on another project. This was a project on baby loss and grief funded by the Elizabeth Blackwell Institute for Health Research and the Wellcome Trust Institutional Strategic Support Fund. So inspired by Jade Perkins' gathering, we invited her to work with us to co-produce a booklet on grief and baby loss, stillbirth, neonatal death, and the grief journey. And this is a co-produced resource. resource. Um, it brought together research evidence, the insights and words of bereaved parents, a bereavement midwife, and it was also made in collaboration with SAMS, a stillbirth and neonatal death charity. Um, and we're now in the process of working with charities and midwives to get it disseminated as a free resource. So I hope um, that gives you some sense of why integrating the arts has been a really important component for us, and also to give you a flavor of how people can work across faculties and with partners outside the university to engage in co-produced research and creative outputs. Thanks for listening um, and I'll hand back to Lucy. Thank you so much, Liesl. Um, for the remainder of our talk, I wanted to draw out some more details about the Good Grief audience and um, the engagement that we've had with it. Um, so to date, just over 24,500 people have now attended or watched Good Grief events, which is far more than we could ever have anticipated. So for comparison, the capacity of the O2 in London in this image is 20,000. So it's quite phenomenal to think um, of so many people having access to the events and I hope benefited for them as well. Um, We've, since October 2020, 8,000 people have subscribed to the Grief Channel, which offers CPD points via the Royal College of Physicians. And we've built up a strong following on social media and email. But I think most rewarding for me and the rest of the team has been seeing how people engage with and contribute to the online chat, which runs alongside our events. And we also have a community blackboard on our website where the audience can leave messages. And this is run via Padlet. And you can see just a short um, extract of this um, here. But if you go to our website, you can you can have a have a scroll through. So the media have shown a strong interest in the festival, especially the first one in October 2020. Um, the university estimated that um, 72 news articles about the festival reached an audience of over 1.2 billion. I've also been co-leading a study of bereavement during the pandemic since August 2020, and we were able to use media interest um, in the study to highlight the festival and vice versa, and I'll mention more about that shortly. We conducted an evaluation of the festival, and I briefly want to outline some of the key findings from the post-festival survey, which I'm currently writing up. <clears throat> and we're really grateful to Dr. Fiona Fox, who I hope is somewhere in the audience, um, an independent researcher who conducted four focus groups after the festival with audience members in four groups. So older people, younger people, people from black or minority ethnic communities and men. I'm not presenting this data here, but we use it to inform the development of the subsequent festivals. And this was really important um, data. So in terms of who came, um, you can see here, the festival is much more popular with women or at least it's mainly women who complete the evaluation surveys. So around 90% of the, of the people who complete the surveys are women, which is um, really interesting and you know, something that we might want to discuss later. Around 10% of the audience are from black and minority ethnic communities. And we um, this increased by 2% from the first to the second festival. And we did pay significant attention to content and speakers and facilitators um, and obviously worked closely with our collaborators to try and um, ensure that the content was 
um, inclusive and appropriate and um, attractive and engaging for a diverse range of um, audience members. Around 15% of the audience are less than 34 years old. Um, and the proportion of people um, aged 65 or older increased from 20% to 25% from the first to the second festival. Over half of the people attending are members of the public and 77% attend to learn about grief and bereavement, 52% to be inspired and 49% to feel part of a like-minded community. Um, almost everyone, so 94% have experienced a bereavement at some point um, and 33% within the last year which obviously for many people would have been during the pandemic. And 10% of the audience live outside the UK. Um, in terms of the rating of the festival experience, um, so happily for us, 89% rated the, the first festival as excellent or very good. And this actually went up to 92% for the second festival. And um, I'm also really gratified that just over three quarters agreed or strongly agreed with the statement that through attending the festival, I feel more confident talking about grief. And again, this did increase slightly for the second festival. And attending a greater number of festival events is actually associated with a higher rating of experience and um, confidence in talking about grief. I wanted to highlight briefly how Good Grief Festival has been integrated with our research and engagement um, with policymakers. So as mentioned, so Dr. Emily Harrop at Cardiff University and I have been leading a study of bereavement during the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact on bereavement services. And then in conjunction with this, we are both on the steering group for a new UK commission on bereavement, which was launched by Marie Curie and other charity partners in June 2021. The Commission has been collating written and oral evidence from the autumn of 21 until now, and these will feed into a report and policy recommendations which will come out um, later this year. Together with the festival, these three initiatives have supported and complemented each other in several ways. So we disseminated an online survey for people bereaved during the pandemic at the first Good Grief Festival. And we also used media attention for the festival, for example, an interview on CNN and an article in The Guardian to publicize the, the survey and um, ask people to take part if they've been bereaved during the pandemic. And we also used the festival as a platform to disseminate our research findings, as well as a resource that we could point research participants to. We have quite a, a detailed resources page as well on the festival website. The festival and the research study also supported policy engagement. So Good Grief actually delivered the launch of the call for evidence for the um, new UK commission. And research evidence has been used as a media hook to publicize the call for evidence. And um, at the last festival in October, 2021, raised awareness of that call for evidence, which is now closed. And then finally, the research itself has, of course, supported public engagement by contributing content and expertise, um, some of which Liesl outlined in terms of the creative grieving um, arts research that she led on. And because media attention for the research um, has been quite high, that's also been an opportunity to publicise both the festivals as well as the policy work. So some final reflections now. Um, first of all, uh, I think this work has been hugely rewarding and it's really enjoyable collaborating with others to bring about change and benefit people who are struggling. Time pressure and time management have at times been a challenge, especially when you are trying to judge what is over ambitious versus what needs perseverance and dedication. And of course, we've conducted this work um, in the context of a pandemic and all the additional stresses that that's involved. Um, we've joked that our small team has a sort of scrappy startup mentality, a sort of can-do attitude and the agility to firefight and adapt when we need to. In doing this work, which is often personally motivated, we have had to be conscious of and talk through our own grief and trauma and um, the grief within the team and try to be mindful of each other's and our own boundaries and needs for self-care. And in this regard, we've also thought carefully about safeguarding and support in relation to our audience and the team itself. In terms of takeaway messages, I think a major one is that fundamental to public engagement and its integration with research and policy engagement is really collaboration, networks and relationships. And these need to be established and invested in from the start of a project. 
there's overlap in stakeholder groups and that's been really beneficial in all three of these areas so you know I have relationships now with people who've been involved in the festival who are also involved in the um, UK Commission on Bereavement um, and have helped um, draw attention to the research and link me with organisations that could have helped us with disseminating um, the, the survey for example. Um, when collaborating, I think there's sometimes real freedom being an academic, as you have allegiance not to an organisation with real stakes in this area, but to a cause that you're able to pursue in a more independent way. Bringing who you are and your personal experience is certainly a strength, and it can help you to establish good and trusting relationships. But of course, you do need to be mindful of boundaries, as I mentioned. It's essential to build in inclusivity in your engagement plan and activities and to consider this carefully and consciously and adapt and evolve in a guided way. And finally, good grief would not have been possible without luck and serendipity and a willingness to embrace the messiness of this kind of work and seize opportunities as they arise. Before we end, I'd like to briefly flag a new project starting in April, which will build on the work we've done with Good Grief Festival. So we're really delighted to announce today that the National Lottery Foundation is funding Good Grief Connects, which is a two year project which aims to help shift the public conversation around death and grief and create a more inclusive, compassionate and open society. And we aim to do this by, first of all, developing, delivering and evaluating three pilot community development projects working with partner organizations. And these are Compassion in Dying, the Abele Initiative and Compassionate Cymru in Wales. Second, we'll be sharing and uh, learning and disseminating best practice from across the UK in community engagement and development around grief, death and dying, creating and supporting a strong supportive network of organizations working together. And then third, we'll be developing an online grief hub, which will be um, an evolution of our current um, Good Grief website, which provides resources and events and signposts to stakeholders and provides people with the knowledge and confidence to support themselves and each other. Our huge thanks to everyone who has attended and contributed to Good Grief, all of our co-applicants, collaborators and supporters, um, the small but mighty Good Grief team, especially event director Ashling Mustan, um, all of the festival funders, the Wellcome Trust, the University of Bristol, Marie Curie, Memorial Woodlands and the National Lottery Foundation. Our contact details are available for anyone who'd like to get in touch. Um, and as was mentioned at the beginning um, by Katrina, this is the first in the series of webinars which the Centre for Academic Primary Care is running and details about the next webinar will be circulated shortly. Um, so if you'd like to um, follow CAPSI and um, Bristol on Twitter or sign up for the CAPSI newsletter, you'll be kept up to date about the forthcoming webinars. So thank you all so much for listening and we'd be really pleased to take any questions. Thank you so much, Lucy and Liesl, for an absolutely fantastic presentation. I'm sure loads of us have learned a lot. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat, which are fantastic, so I will read those out and I encourage anyone else, um, if you have a question, please post it in the chat or put your hand up using the, the raised hand function and then you can unmute and ask the question. So Kate has asked, sorry if you covered this already, but how did you market stroke publicise the festival to the public? Um, so there were a couple of ways. So I think one of the main ways was via our, the networks that we had through our collaborators. Um, and also because of the research I was doing as well, that kind of, you know, I had a certain, we, we well, and Liesl as well, but we had our certain academic networks too. Um, and then the other way was um, via social media. So we invested in um, Facebook advertising and when we moved the festival online, we invested in the, in the Facebook advertising and that was really effective as well. So we found that the more we invested in that, the more people were signing up. So that was a great way of kind of getting the word out. And I think it's worth saying too, that we did spend quite a bit of time um, getting the sort of, you know, the, 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 the moth logo together. Mm -hmm. And Ashley and also, you know, the kind of, the certain images and looks so that it was sort of recognizable. And I think that that did help then every time something came out, it was identifiable. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think what, you know, working with, um, working with people with expertise in this area is 
you know, is essential really, because they have insights and um, knowledge that you just wouldn't necessarily have as an academic kind of going into this for the first time. Great, thank you. So there's two questions from Tracy, one of which touches on what you've just been talking about, but she's asking, can you say more about your communication strategy? How did you get the word out so successfully, especially at a time there's lots of demands on people's time and attention? Mm. Um, I mean, I think a few things happened. I think we were actually in a, in a kind of lucky position because we were planning a festival about grief and bereavement pre-pandemic. So we were quite at quite an advanced stage in terms of um, programming and things like that. Um, and the look and the website. So, and then I think the second thing that happened is then when we launched online, it was still a time when there were very few online festivals. Um, I think the, the kind of landscape has changed a lot since that first festival in October. Um, and certainly, you know, we've noticed a change in our audience numbers and things like that since the first festival. Um, and then the other thing was just that because of the timing of it at that time in October 2020, the media were really interested. Um, and so we were able to sort of launch and have that festival at a time when there was increasing awareness and public conversation around grief and bereavement and death and dying in the context of the pandemic. People were stuck at home and, you know, we were all having to get used to these, you know, the, the lockdown situation. So people were interested suddenly in, in online events. So I think there was a lot of, yeah, there was a lot of luck and kind of serendipity in, in what happened and in how it got picked up um, by the media. Um, does that answer the question? I'm sorry. I would, I would also say, just going Go back to the point you made previously, Lucy, that yeah. because we had these very established collaborators in charities, authors, talking heads, that they also did a lot of the publicity for us. Yeah. So they use their networks to get the word out. And we had, you know, we had Julia, Samuel, we had Jane Harris, we had lots of people actually going on the radio also and plugging the festivals. So those networks and those partnerships really helped us. Yeah, thank you, Liesl. And having um, crews, for example, you know, they they kind of came on board and were, were able to help with advertising, as, as Liesl said. I think the collaborators did a yeah, a huge amount of work in that respect too. Great, thank you. And Josie's second question was, what was the key to, to, sorry, what was the key to delivering such a complex festival involving multiple speakers and collaborators? Was there, was there anything in particular you did as a team or any organisational tools that helped run things smoothly? <laughs> I think we we had regular meetings and we um, we used um, Asana, which is a, a project management type um, tool, which we, I haven't used before, but Ashling had used for events before. Um, I think having an event manager was was essential, really, because, you know, they have certain processes and and ways of um, ensuring that, that, that major events kind of come off smoothly. So I think we benefit, benefited from that. Um, Lisa, was there anything else? No, I mean, we were kind of flying by the seat of our pants at some, in some ways. Yeah. <laughs> Each festival, we also revise things. So I think we, we started with quite a, a crazy level of complexity and then we managed to pare things down a little bit. It did also help to have some pre-records and some live events. So we, we sort of built in a few cushions for ourselves, um, but we did learn as we went, but having Ashleen as well was crucial. Mm. Great, thank you. Um, another question. I'm interested to know how you divided up the work between researchers, professional service staff in your department and the wider university services. Um, the honest answer there is really that um, it was mainly done outside of the university, the sort of planning and the project management and the um, comms and the PR and the marketing. Um, we had great support from, you know, some of the, the comms experts at the university kind of went once we got to the stage where we had a press release or, you know, um, we had something to advertise. That was really helpful. But most of the sort of design and um, delivery and production was all done outside of the university, working with, um, yeah, working with kind of university approved suppliers. But, um, yeah, I, th I think uh, I think that might 
yeah, I think that has pros and cons. I think um, it gave us a certain amount of freedom and agility um, because we were working with kind of external partners and contractors. Um, I think within the university, things maybe would have been a bit different, a bit slower. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, there are pros and cons kind of in each, each way of doing it. But I, one of the things right from the start was I was really keen that the website didn't look like an academic university website. I wanted it to look different and to be kind of standalone um, website. And I think that is the right decision because not everyone feels comfortable in university environments and you automatically kind of give that um, that sheen of like academia if, it, if it's kind of hosted within the university, I think. Um, Liz, or do you want to chip in? You covered it. Okay, so uh, a question from Joan here. I assume your reach became much greater than you initially had thought by moving everything online. Fewer people would have physically have to come from Bristol. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we were thinking, you know, if we'd, if we'd reached 2000, that would have been brilliant, you know, with a week long event in Bristol, that would have been, you know, a real achievement. So the fact that we had the number that we did have um, was to do with it moving it online but I'd also say with the move online that I was actually really worried about um, what we might lose uh, moving it online um, you know I was worried you'd, you'd lose the sense of connection um, and community and that um, it might feel and just not have the same kind of effect but actually what we found in the evaluation was that um, almost everyone was really pleased it was online and a lot of people talked about how they felt much safer because they were at home in their own environments and they could choose kind of how much to dip in and out of events. Um, whereas if you're going to like an actual face-to-face -face festival on grief, you'd have to A, get there, and then B, you'd be at this festival on grief and it's much more, um, you know, you don't have your, your safety and it's a bit more difficult to sort of, to, to get away and dip out when you need to. Um, so I think there were sort of unanticipated, kind of unanticipated um, benefits the audience and moving it online and I, and I would say what you said previously about the the online chat and community mm -hmm. I think it's the thing that if you watch the good grief channel you don't see the chat that had run along live beside it but it was very powerful and moving and you know people would talk to one another online and share stories and be compassionate so I think that was a very powerful unexpected part of the online festival mm, yeah yeah definitely I should I should have said that I think um yeah what my fears around that loss of kind of community and connection um were, were unfounded in the end you know we we really we were so kind of impressed and amazed to see the extent to which people were, were sharing their experiences and, and supporting each other so that was really um heartwarming to see really Great, thank you. Um, Alison's asking, how did you go about organising the community projects and what was the process of, for selecting who got the grants? Yeah, so with those, we really benefited from um, another contractor um, that we worked with um, called Gemma, and I've forgotten her second name, but anyway, she had a really good um, knowledge of all the different community groups. Um, she'd worked on a number of different festivals um, in Bristol that had kind of used a similar model. <clears throat> so that was really brilliant. Um, we, we basically wrote a brief and we tried to keep it really short. So some of the feedback from, from collaborators was, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people when they launch kind of small funding schemes, you kind of ask the people applying to sort of do so much work, put so much work and effort into the applications just for like 500 pounds or a thousand pounds that it's actually prohibitive for some people. So we tried to keep it very brief um, and give them a steer, but also, um, yeah, very much leave it up to people in terms of, you know, coming up with really creative ideas. I and mean, we had some really incredible submissions um, sort of community events and um, drumming circles and music based events and arts, you know, art exhibitions, poetry, film nights, all sorts of things. Um, and once people submitted via the website, they could submit that kind of brief application form. Sometimes we went back 
if we felt like actually they haven't given full enough details, we would kind of go back and, and encourage that. And then we we sat down as a team and basically went through the applications. And I think we had about um, 45 or so applications and they covered all different areas of Bristol, you know, from sea mills to, you know, Redlands to everywhere. Um, and uh, we we awarded just over half of them funding. So that was really heartbreaking because we, you know, that happened in the sort of January, February. And then by March, it was like, we're not going to be able to do this and we're not going to be able to run the community events in the way we would have, want, what we would have wanted to do. Um, but we, yeah, that's certainly something that I would I would really like to do again, um, a scheme like that, because I think it's, um, it's a great way of, um, yeah, making the festival more inclusive and ensuring people um, feel part of it and have that kind of ownership of it too. Right, and James responded to that by saying thank you. We've been, um, they've been running a small Dying Matters community grant fund in Leeds for the last four years and it's definitely grown year on year. Yeah, so, yeah, and they have, there's actually a call out at the moment, so the National Dying Matters have got a call out for uh, it's a similar type scheme. Um, so if anyone's interested, I think it's up to up to five thousand pounds, kind of maximum, for events to put on um, at Dying Matters Week this year. So those are. Oops, I was about to say those are all the questions in the chat. One's just popped up. Um, will there be some follow up research exploring in more detail? That oh, sorry, I'll read it from the beginning. So Cynthia is asking. Really interesting in hearing a bit more about the experiences. Mm -hmm. Minoritized groups, particularly migrants, new first generation, etc. Will there be some follow up research exploring in more detail their views? Um, so the focus groups that that um, um, Dr. Fiona Fox conducted after the festival, we did explore some of those issues. So there was a focus group for Black and minoritized um, ethnic communities where some of these issues um, were discussed. We also kind of moving forward to the second and third festival, we did build in much more content specifically on those topics like intergenerational differences, um, culture, migration, refugees, um, which I was really keen were included and were explored. The Good Grief Connects, one thing that's really exciting about the new project is that we um, have these um, pilot projects which are working in specific um, ethnic minority communities. So for example, the one in London with Compassion in Dying is working with um, South Asian communities in Newham, which is one of the most um, you know, de deprived areas of the UK. Um, and I think that's gonna be really interesting because you do need to do that sort of um, detailed specific work with, specific, with communities. Um, so it's gonna be really interesting to kind of see how that goes and then what we can learn from that and use the Good Grief platform as a way of sharing that learning um, so yeah thank, thank you and Ellie's asking um do you have the link for the dying matters call maybe she could email you later using the email address you posted up. yeah yeah or well, if you just google um dying matters community fund I think it's called you, you should come up um how did you get CPD accreditation so um when we were having the live event, we had a, a conference, a five day, four day conference planned at the university, um, which included, um, you know, clinicians, academics, uh, members of the public and bereavement counsellors and charities. Um, so we went to um, the Royal College of Physicians for CPD for that conference. And then when COVID happened and we had to move online, um, I approached them and they had a scheme where, you know, if you had a... Um, if you had a face-to-face -face event which should then had to be moved online you could apply and get your CPD transferred so we did it that way um, and they also had um, you can also then apply after the event to ask for the um, recorded um, sessions for online events to also um, have those CPD points attached to them as well so that's what we did so I felt I felt like the Royal College of Physicians were actually really understanding um, in that regard I mean you have to show that the content that people are getting is, um, you know, valuable and is going to inform their clinical practice. And I feel really strongly that the content is useful in that regard. So any other questions either in the chat or if people want to raise a hand, that's another way of indicating you have a question to ask. Mm. 
know. I mean, it's been absolutely fascinating listening to you both, and thank you for sharing so much uh, of your experiences and the knowledge and what you've gained. I guess I was really struck, Lucy, by how it sounded at the beginning. You were very clear in your own head about what it would be and what it wouldn't be. But then suddenly, you know, COVID happened and online, you know, you had to move online. Whether, And it's been on this massive journey and you've now had three festivals, I think it is. Whether it still is what you imagined it to be at the beginning or whether it's changed and shaped over time and, and has become slightly something else because of COVID. Mm. Yeah, I think it has. Um, and I think that initial change to from it being live to online was actually really hard for all of us because we invested so much and we were at such a um advanced stage in terms of the, you know the design and the ticketing and everything. Um and then it it sort of took on a bit of a life of its own. I think um we weren't expecting, for example, The Guardian to publish an article about Good Grief Festival in the lead up to the first festival. Um, so yeah, so it ha it definitely has evolved and changed, but I think the thing that's the same, I mean, it's not what I imagined from the beginning, because I imagined it as a, as a live event, you know, a face-to-face -face event, but I think the things that, that has always stayed the same is that vision of what we were trying to achieve. Um, so we, we kind of had a clear idea, okay, now we're moving online, we want to achieve the same things, how do we do that online? Um, so it's been, yeah, it's been really rewarding. And I think I'll probably speak for Liesl as well, but I think we've learned a hell of a lot about public engagement and about online events and all sorts of things that we didn't quite think we would be learning about over the last couple of years. And I would say it's become even more collaborative because people approach us, speakers approach us with ideas. And so it's kind of evolved organically and with more people feeding into the segments, the interviews, the events. Great. Well, lots of people are commenting in the chat now saying thank you and thank you. Um, we're coming to the end of the first webinar. It's been absolutely fascinating, as I said. So thank you both um, for presenting today and for sharing everything. Um, and thank you to everyone else who's joined us today. It's great to have such a fantastic audience for this first webinar. Um, as I said earlier, it is being recorded and it will be posted on the Centre of Academic Primary Care's website and also a PDF of the, the slides will be circulated to you. So um, I guess if we're all in a room, I can imagine a huge round of applause. Um, but yes, thank you to our presenters. Thank you also to Helen Bolton, who um, organised all this and put it all together, who's our Centre um, Communications Officer. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.